the secret to marketing movies like brands and will Vessel crush YouTube? This is episode 18 of Media Unplugged, the podcast that goes behind the spin to reveal what's really happening in media. Media Unplugged with Tom A. Sacker and Mark Ramsey. Welcome to Media Unplugged. I am Mark Ramsey. And I'm Tom A. Sacker. Tom, the secret to marketing movies like brands. This is drawn from a piece in Adweek, uh, Lost Remote actually, called Looking at TV and Film as Brands. Um, I found this to be really interesting in part because of the way the piece opened. Now, just bear with me. Here's how it opens. It begins with a conversation about a movie nobody should be talking about if they're in their right mind, which is Paul Blart Mall Cop 2, which, by the way, does not roll off the tongue. <laughs> just try it. Paul Blart Mall. Yeah, it is See? a tough one. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one. Anyway, the, the, the piece opens by saying Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 had a solid opening weekend coming in just behind Furious 7. Now, I thought... Let me do some homework on that. Paul Blart opened with 24 million in the U.S. Furious 7 opened with 147 million. Tom, they were this close. That's just behind, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> neck and neck. I begin to wonder what the purpose of, the, of this article is from the get-go when I see a kind of a spurious statistic like that. But here's the, 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 the gist of this thing. Before it hit theaters, Viacom was making sure that Paul Blart fans everywhere, yes, you, 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 and you, knew he was back on the scene. To do this, they combined forces with talent familiar to fans likely to buy a ticket to see a mall cop movie. I mean, at this point, you should be laughing about the... <laughs> so what did that mean? In this case, that meant, um, that meant uh, they had somebody from CMT, uh, and they did a music video. And the music video got play on CMT, um, it went on their weekly countdown show, CMT Hot 20, and it was amplified across CMT.com and on social pages. And as the guy at uh, Viacom says, we strategically aligned our plans with talent to build awareness and it spread organically from there. So yeah, the, I, it made it to media unplugged. Yeah, that's a good point. We've been taken like the rest of them. Yep. So um, I get theoretically the value of this, which is if you treat films and television as brands and create content which isn't necessarily about the film but kind of has elements of the film in it and are designed to you know entertain people not necessarily to sell the film but to sell around the film if you will then it keeps that film that brand on the radar for an extended period of time, which in the case of a movie helps because it's in the theater for a certain number of weeks and then it's on DVD and then it's on demand. And, of course, there's sequels and franchises and other elements. So, in other words, it keeps the movie alive. When you think of it as a brand rather than a film, you think less of opening day alone and more of kind of the uh, lifelong journey of the film across time. Does that make sense? I, listen, I know, what, I know what they're doing. I have a problem with the thinking of it like a brand and not like a movie. Mm -hmm. What's... Tell me the distinction in your mind so I can see, because I'm trying to understand what the writer meant by think of it as a brand and not as a movie. Here's my take on it. First of all, I would argue that every TV show and movie increasingly thinks of themselves as a brand. And by association, every brand thinks of itself as media, whether it be television, uh, 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 film or something else. Uh, I give you the Lego movie. What is that? Brand, media, TV, film, <laughs> um, uh, theme park. Um, if somebody's spending money to, to purchase something, to view something, to consume something, that thing is a brand. Yes. You, you can call it a movie or you can call it a box of popcorn. It doesn't matter. If you're exchanging money for it, it's a brand. Yes. I, I think what the writer is getting at is that the people who are creating uh, the content around the brand, the, the marketing, the promotion, et cetera, are thinking less of opening day and thinking more of the long term. Thus, they're creating elements which have a life of their own apart from the, um, the, the, the box office take for the film. Okay. Listen, that's simply smart marketing. So what, yes. here's what they do. They're looking for a brand partnership that has some kind of creative synergy in which, to their point, will appeal to the same audience. Yes. And celebrities 
by the way, are brands. Yes, they are. Right? And then you leverage the popularity of the two brands to drive awareness for both. So Jesse James Decker got exposure. Mm -hmm. Paul Blart got exposure. And then by association, their work gets exposure. Her music, his movie. Now the key, the creative key, which I've seen tons of organizations screw up, is to make sure that all of the brands are in character, hmm. right? Because after all, what's a brand? It's nothing more than a story in someone's head. And you en enhance that story and you strengthen the brand by keeping it in character. And it seemed that they did that with this, with this particular stunt, right? I mean, you could, the essence of, of, of you know, a country singer and Paul Blart and the, the, the comedic element, it all made sense. It makes sense, but is it more than superficial? Because, for example, even in this piece, it indicates that across Facebook and Twitter, the video's reach, according to CMT, it reached an audience of 9.1 million. Now, this, for a movie, which opened with 24 million, um, <laughs> behind the movie that opened with 147 million, in other words... This may be an illustration of the point, but is it an effective one? Because to my eye, did this have any value in the, did, did this matter in the final analysis in terms of who went to the movie or in terms of the lifespan of the movie across other platforms? Who knows? You know, you're back to the 50% of my marketing budget is wasted. I just don't know which 50%. Yes. And I guess my point, my point here, Tom, is that this 9.1 million, that's not, I, they don't know which side of the 50% that is. Well, how do you know when you expose people to a brand? You know, supposedly when the Mars rover landed or the Mars candy bar sales went up because mm -hmm. people kept hearing Mars, Mars, Mars all over the news. Now, now maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's how our brains work. You know, we, we, we see this, you know, Paul Blart, we see this guy singing and we, and we, in the character and we laugh and we go, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go see that movie or I'm going to rent that movie or I don't want to forget that movie. Maybe, maybe well, it, that's what makes this, this thing such a crapshoot. I'll give you 24 million reasons why it didn't work that way in this case. <laughs> <laughs> but look, here's what I think fundamentally. Uh, at t as TV and films see themselves increasingly as brands, at the way we think of brands, brands increasingly see themselves in the role of uh, media, TV, film, etc. And um, when you recognize that and recognize that throughout this process, as you said, all, there, all these elements are branded, uh, actors are branded. One of the things that I took away from the Sony uh, email leak was that actor Kevin Hart was paid to tweet on two movies, and guess how much he was paid? Ah, uh, I can't wait to hear. <laughs> $2 million. To tweet? Yes, yeah, see, there's money in Twitter after oh, all. Oh, my goodness, see? <laughs> what am I doing wrong over here? <laughs> You're listening to Media Unplugged with Tom Asacker and Mark Ramsey. Tom, will Vessel crush YouTube? That's the question, isn't that it? <laughs> 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 I think we need to begin with kind of explaining what Vessel is. Vessel is the new platform from the former uh, CEO of Hulu, Jason Killar, Killer, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but Vessel's his new platform, which is very Hulu looking, by the way. But it, here's the way to think about it. What Hit Radio is to the iTunes store, Vessel wants to be to YouTube. So Vessel is doing deals that uh, with, you know, the, the big uh, content makers, especially the big millennial content makers on YouTube and elsewhere, uh, for the first 72 hours uh, that they create that content, that content lives only on Vessel, and then it's available on other platforms, YouTube, etc. But for that first 72 hours, it's only going to live on Vessel. And in exchange, they're going to get a bunch more money um, and uh, Vessel's going to get a bunch more attention. It's going to be the hit radio of uh, the space. What is your take on this? I like the interface. It's pretty slick, minimalist. Um, but look, I suppose you would have to be a really hardcore online video consumer, right? Like a YouTube super fan or something. Yes. To want to pay three bucks, I don't care how much money it is, to receive 
early access to these videos. And by early access, we're talking a few days here. Three days. And three, yeah, not weeks or months or anything. $3 a month, three days of early access, right. Yeah, I'm trying to understand both the the real value equation and and what barriers to entry. Let's say I'm YouTube and, and I'm watching this and I say, okay, l- let's go create a, a really slick early access YouTube channel and let's go get those content creators. And instead of $50 per thousand views, we'll give them 75. <laughs> I, I, I just, you know, $134.5 million for this platform mm-hmm. seems to me to be a big bet on something that's not truly, I don't see the value in it really, or defensible. And, and you help me with this one. Mm-hmm. We, you and I both know that one of the benefits of having early access to things is to show it off. Yes. So here's where I'm confused. Okay, so I go on Vessel and I watch as part of my, you know, $3 a month, I have early access and I watch, say, an entertaining clip from the Ellen DeGeneres show. Mm-hmm. If I want to share that, can I? I I, uh, I didn't even think of that, but that's a great question, the shareability. I don't know the answer to that. I wish we talked about that beforehand and we'll look that up because you're right. That's going to create a real obstacle. Now, here's what we do know, that new users to Vessel get the first 30 days free. And if you, were, if you signed up, I think, in the first three days of Vessel, like I did, you get a year free, which is another way of saying it's going to be a very long time until these guys make back their nut for starters. Um, but secondly, it is possible that if you can share and you're sharing to someone who isn't on Vessel, then that sharing activity grants them essentially 30 days free simply by nature of the share. So I don't know that that's the way it works, but that clearly that is one way it could work. I don't think anybody's pumping a credit card number in, into any 30-day free platform to watch a, you know, a minute of Ellen. <laughs> I, I just, I don't see it happening. All right. Well, let me, let me give you my sense because I think it tracks very closely with yours. I think these guys, if you read closely the literature that they're writing, it's all about two constituencies, the advertisers and the creators, the content creators. Left out of that equation are consumers. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. The most important component. (laughs) The most important component because they say, well, these are YouTube stars. These are people who already have audiences. Yes, these are people who already have audiences for free, who view their content for free. I think they are immensely underestimating the value of free and the cost of cost. Um, (laughs) No, no, listen, I think you're absolutely right. Look, I got a lot of people that read my stuff free. Mm Mm-hmm. They're not buying my book. <laughs> <laughs> not that a lot of people aren't buying your book, but I understand your, your larger point. So I think there's too much emphasis here on the content creators, not nearly enough on consumers. And the other thing about consumers is these are YouTube stars. Now, who are the primary audience of YouTube stars? Kids. Who has the less money to spend on things that are subscription-based like this? Kids. So in a sense, the worst audience for their content is the very audience that they're targeting with this content. Second, I don't see how they can attract stars, you know, existing stars who want their first three days to be more heavily monetized. But how are they going to be able to create stars? To create stars, you have to start from no audience and build an audience, right? So the only way, in other words, YouTube would be the place to create the stars, and theoretically, Vessel would be a place to exploit them, but Vessel is never going to be able to create a star. They're only going to try and appropriate that from YouTube, and as you indicate, why shouldn't YouTube try and put the kibosh on that as quickly as possible? Yeah, there's a lot of, there are a lot of holes in this, in my mind. I think so, too, and I, the other thing about this that you may have noticed is they're going out of their way, and I just, I had to laugh when I saw this, they're going out of their way to make the ad, the ads here's here's the quote they're they're ads to be both unobtrusive for consumers and beneficial for brands yeah okay right yeah so in other words the more unobtrusive you make the ads somehow that's going to be more beneficial for the brand they've got if you've seen any of the ads on vessel they're five seconds long the pre rolls are five seconds long you literally don't know what you've just seen by the time it's over 
Um, it, I, I think what they're going to discover is you can't make unobtrusive advertising that works. Oh, you meant that works. Oh, I thought you meant that people <laughs> actually watch. Because <laughs> see, what, what, what the marketers want to do is go back to the boss and say, they're watching them all. 9.1 million people saw Plart, Paul Blart Mall Cop, too. That's it. All right, it's time for rants and raves. Tom, what do you have for us this week? Oh, that's right. I get to go first. Well, here's something new. I'm going to rave. Wow. Yeah, and I'm going to rave about two people that have nothing in common and everything in common. And it's Sean Mendez and Mavis Staples, hmm. two stars who shine bright because they really get it. So Sean Mendez, I don't, have you heard of this guy? No. 16-year-old Canadian-born singer. He was discovered, get ready, on Vine, mm -hmm. the short-form video sharing mm -hmm. platform, in late 2013. He was signed by Island Records the following year, last year. Mm -hmm. Last week, his debut album called Handwritten, soared to number one on the Billboard 200. Hmm. He sold 119,000 copies of the album in its first week, dethroning the Furious 7 soundtrack. <laughs> now, this is a 16-year-old Sean Mendez who succeeded with, what, a lot of hard work, a bit of luck, and being at the right place at the right time. Now, here's the thing, Mark. There was no radio airplay. Mm. What made this kid a superstar were his social media fans. Mm -hmm. And here's what he had to say. This is what he said. From when I started posting vines, I always just was doing me. And then when it started to take off, I just kept posting and kept interacting with my fans. I think the most important part is that I stay in touch with them on socials and by playing shows and giving them new music because at the end of the day, they're what makes this all happen. Which brings me to my second rave for the soulful singer, Mavis Staples of the Staples Singers fame. 75-year-old mm -hmm. Mavis just released a new EP called Your Good Fortune. Now, what does the legendary Mavis think of her good fortune, of herself and her success? Much the same as Mendes. Here's what she says. I'm just plain old Mavis. I've never looked at myself as being a star. I still do everything for myself. I go to the grocery store. I go to the cleaners. I go to the laundromat. I mingle. You have to be out there with the people to know what the people need. Mm. So that's my rave for two, what I call everyday people, separated in age by six decades, <laughs> but connected in spirit by both a love for their craft and for the people who love and support them. See, age doesn't matter today, Mark. Attitude is what matters. Oh, that's awesome, Tom. That I, I can't top that. I should have had you go second. You should have warned me. <laughs> oh, there you go. I won one. <laughs> that's terrific. I love that one. Um, all right. I have a couple of uh, rants, in, and I'm not sure whether it's a rave or what it is, but we're going to go through it. The, the first one is definitely a rant, okay? This is from a piece from Media Biz Bloggers, which we know because we're on Media Biz Bloggers. Um, this is not from us. The title is Fast and Furiously, Movie Going Millennials Are Back. This is from a guy named Douglas Pulick. I'll tell you who he is in a second, and I'm going to tell you where they went. So here's how the thing opens. It says, just when many in the mainstream media were writing off 2014's millennial attendance as the beginning of the end to a long love affair the movies have had with adolescents and young adults, the release of the latest installment of the hugely successful Fast and Furious franchise, Furious 7, reignited the power of the silver screen to attract droves of young people to the local bijou. Let's leave aside the fact that that could have been written in about one-third as many words. Right. <laughs> so I thought, well, wait a minute. So he's actually arguing here that more people went to see Fast and Furious than than gathered for any other entertainment experience of any kind, including the NCAA championships and NCIS and Big Bang, Bang Theory and Dancing with the Stars and all that. But I was particularly curious about the claim on millennials. Um, and then I noticed um, who this man was. He is the senior vice president of a company that leads national cinemedia 
Marketing's uh, NCM, National Cine Media's Marketing Sales and Advertising Research Team. In other words, he's working for the theater. <laughs> well, how are they tracking millennials? Well, let me give you some facts. Um, uh, here are the facts. Um, Nielsen, uh, an authoritative source, reported from 20, 2007 to 2014 that millennials saw in 2007 9.6 movies per month. In 2014, it's down to 7.1. That is a dramatic reduction. Okay, so that's the context of this piece. What I object to about this piece, and the reason why this is a rant, is because this man is using an exceptional movie, an outlier, to make to to create a broad brushstroke point that is invalid except as it applies to an outlier. You can't use an outlier to make a broad point. That's why it's called an outlier. This is going to be, this is going to be maybe one of the by the time all all the grosses are in, it'll probably be one of the top fifty movies of all time. You cannot make a conclusion about a generational movie attendance trends on the basis of one film. You just can't. No, you're not supposed to is what you meant to say. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's, here's rant number two. You certainly are familiar with Affleck Gate, are you not? This is the story of uh, Ben Affleck's slave-owning ancestors. You haven't heard of this, Tom? <laughs> yes, I read about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love this. Okay, so Affleck did a story on his ancestors with PBS to track his, his heritage. Come to find out that way back down the family lineage, Ben Affleck has ancestors that own slaves. Ben asked PBS to please not... Uh, to, to please uh, squash that for the purpose of the show. And they acquiesced and said, okay, we'll leave it out. And then because of, again, the big Sony email uh, uh, a leak, uh, this was revealed to the world and Ben was suitably embarrassed and PBS, more to the point, was embarrassed. And I thought, this is just a minute. Why is anybody surprised, first of all, that an actor is vain? You know, <laughs> let's begin there. I mean, Anybody who knows anything about any actors knows that, of course, they're going to say, please don't tell America that my ancestors own slaves. I'm an actor. Right. I was once at a movie, uh, um, a movie um, industry uh, awards event with my wife, and uh, Kevin Spacey was there. So I approached Kevin Spacey. I said, Kevin, could I take a picture of you with my, with my wife? And he said, sure. How much money do you have? No. So I reach in my pocket. <laughs> To take out my wallet, he says, no, 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 I'm just kidding. Of course, you can take the picture. And I'm thinking, well, <laughs> I don't know the rules, you know, uh, but you got to go with what the movie star wants. So that's number two, the vanity <laughs> of Hollywood. Number three. I thought he was going to charge you. That was like a friend of mine had some baseball player. He handed him a ball to sign and, and the baseball player said, I'm sorry, I only sign things that are flat. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the, the rave. Um, this is great. This is from Ad Week. And apparently, as you know, HBO Now, the new platform we've talked about before, is out. And Game of Thrones uh, has a new season that's a couple episodes underway right now. Well, um, the availability on Game of Thrones uh, on HBO Now was one of the big selling points for HBO Now. Um, HBO Now did a campaign in New York to kind of launch that uh, with Uber. And the campaign was called Hashtag Ride of Thrones <laughs> because Uber users for two days in April could request that a replica Iron Throne no way. be brought to their location via a clear glass truck so they can take a requisite selfie in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just genius. Yeah. That is, a. I mean, again, it, it, it talk about having... You know, the brand in character across all platforms. That's that, it, right I mean, there. That covers it right there. Now, maybe not so in character is one other aspect of this, which I didn't mention to you, which is another spin on Game of Thrones, because what is the ultimate throne? The toilet, of course. Oh, no. And indeed, there's someone building what's called the world's most powerful toilet. <laughs> That's out of character. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Iron Throne toilet from Game of Thrones. A super fan actually built... A Game of Thrones throne. Oh, that guy needs help. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It comes in all shapes and sizes. 
That's that's Media Unplugged for this week. Please remember to subscribe to us at iTunes or on Stitcher. And while you're there, please rate the show. It helps other folks discover us. You can catch us at SoundCloud, Podcast One, Radio Inc., Media Biz Bloggers, and Net News Check. I haven't forgotten anybody, have I? Wow, we're growing. <laughs> that's what I keep saying. <laughs> I keep telling people that. You can follow Tom on Twitter at Tom Asacker and Mark at Mark Ramsey Media. Send us your questions and comments using hashtag Media Unplugged. We forgot to mention, by the way, that the vessel topic today was the product of some feedback that we got. So thanks for that uh, topic. If there is a media topic you want us to cover, tweet us. You can read the show notes and share the show at our website, MediaUnplugged.net. Special thanks to the Uber producer of Media Unplugged, Jeff Uber Schmidt. Exciting audio for media. You can find him at jeff-schmidt.com. For Tom Asecker, I'm Mark Ramsey. Thank you so much for listening.